Lancaster isn't a huge city by any means, but it's a convenient one. Small cars and bikes ride around, and still others on foot shop local shops run by local entrepreneurs that sell local goods. Lancaster is well known in the Northeast for its connection to the Amish, who live in the surrounding countryside and bring their goods to market. Aside from the Amish, there's a huge ethnic diversity among fancy people. The thing that Lancastrians, as they're called, have in common is that they seem to love what comes out of the hearts, hands, and minds of their fellow citizens. There was something about the geographic placement of the city that made you think it would always be one of those quaint little towns. You couldn't find a big box store except on the outskirts, and the nearby cities of Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC, and even New York were easy places to travel by train or car. So Lancaster never felt the need to be like those cities. But when I moved to Lancaster in 2005, something interesting was happening. The city was experiencing a renaissance of the arts. Art galleries were opening up entire blocks. Restaurants were getting more interesting. And the music, well, it seems the music had always been here. In the late summer of 2005, I loaded into the back entrance of the Chameleon Club, a vaulted gray door on North Prince Street. My first view of this venue was on stage in front of 800 screaming kids. The club defied its own existence in a city of the past and in a world where music was heavily commoditized. I could look into the eyes of these fans and see that they wanted to be there, not to be seen, not to say that they were there, but they wanted to be part of something that they knew was special, but maybe didn't know why it was special. I made it my mission over the next several years to find out why. I'm the owner of the Chameleon Club in beautiful downtown Lancaster. Rich, when yes. did you first decide to be a club owner? I was about 22 years of age, 1985, and I'd been all over the country and seen a lot of great music in other cities, and I came back to Lancaster and I realized it really wasn't happening. So I thought that if I were going to do something, a good thing to do would be to open a club in Lancaster and bring in great music. There's a restaurant in town, it used to be in town, it's not here anymore, it was called Tom Payne's Restaurant. I knew that there was a room in the back that used to be used for shows. I did a cold call, I walked in the front door of the restaurant and I met the owner, Commander King, literally a retired naval commander. Uh, I said, uh, hi, I'm Rich Ruoff and uh, I'd like to open up your back room. You know, can we work out a deal? I used to be a maintenance man at a high-rise apartment building. It was a good training ground for running a club because it's a lot of maintenance involved with keeping a club up. So a little bit of money I saved from that and I borrowed some money from my brother, about $5,000, and we just went in, did some paint and clean up, and started on the fly with no experience. We'd never booked a band, we'd never bartended. We took one of those cheap bartending courses really quick and uh, we opened up. Had my dad drive me over to North Christian Street. I said, wait in the car, and I went in, and there was a guy in his low 20s, like, kind of working, you know, and rehabbing the place. And I you have this floppy down mohawk and a leather jacket, and I'm five feet tall. And I said, I, I want to book a show. And, and he said, okay. I almost fell over <laughs> that he said, what do you have in mind instead of beat it, an all-ages show at a, at a new club. And yeah, and the rest is, uh, a long history. A couple things we got lucky on. It worked. We had some good bands in the early days. I had some really good new employees that started with us and people were ready for it. It was an instant buzz that got rolling in the first year and so it was literally week to week that we survived. If we had done too many shows in a row that didn't work I would have been out of business. 
and I went to the Chameleon Club. And this band Living Earth was playing, which was a sort of a Grateful Dead-ish tribute band. People were packed in the place. It was a narrow room that was kind of long, but kind of nondescript. It had a tent ceiling. Um, I think there was a dartboard and a long bar and a stage that was small. Invariably, if you could fit 200 people in it, 210 were there. And so you couldn't help but make friends with people because you, if you wanted to move, you had to say, excuse me, hey, how's it going? Oh yeah, I saw you here last week and we couldn't move either. It got so crowded late that night, I was at the back of the very back of the room and um, I guess it was sort of tent-like also and there was storage and bathrooms behind it. And uh, I stood up on a chair and this waitress came by and she said, get out. And I got down and she walked away and I got back up and she came back through and she said, get down. And I got down off the stool and she walked away and I got back up and she walked through the third time and she looked at me and she said, don't hurt yourself. And she walked away and never bothered me again. And I thought, I'm gonna like it here. I was breakdancing a lot all over town and we'd go to different bars and establishments, the YMCA, the dances, and try to get into breakdance. We uh, went to a place called Tom Payne's. We didn't know the name at the time. We didn't know it was the Chameleon Club and I didn't know Rich Ruoff from a guy that was walking down the street. I just wanted to get in there and break dance. So our crew went in there and uh, he let us break dance and I think he even paid us like 10 bucks. Who would have thought that, you know, 20 years later, I'd be the head DJ at that club. Chameleon first opened up, it was one of the first places there where that was you know, friendly and encouraging to have um, original music. The only other venues at the time were things like coffee houses, things like this. This was a bona fide music club. It was a smaller venue, you know, 200 was packed, 250 was, you know, over packed. So it was easier to take some risk on some up and coming bands and developing bands. That smaller size made for, I think, a little more of an intimate relationship. So you really got to know uh, the people that were, uh, that would come to see you play and then also the people that worked there as well. As soon as they were there, bands started playing there, good bands, and people started coming out to see them. It, it seemed like it just took off immediately. We were new, nobody knew us and I didn't know any booking agents. We did it the old fashioned way. We would go to shows, we'd go to Philadelphia or Baltimore, and every time we saw a band that we liked, we'd stop them after the show and uh, say, hey, we're opening a new club in Lancaster, would you come down and play? Yeah, we would do a monthly flyer, you know, a little hand-drawn calendar. Basically, we were open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. We tried to make it all work in that, in that little time frame. The thing was, on the weekend, there was music. There might be a special show Thursday with a local act, a rock band on Friday, Saturday, it was a reggae band. You just never knew. Tried to mix it up stylistically. The original business card we advertised as jazz, blues, and rock and roll. But we brought blues really into Lancaster. It hadn't been in Lancaster in a big way, and we really grew that up. Of course, you know, rock and roll is such a broad spectrum. Well, in the 80s, new wave was the big new original music. There was even some punk rock back then. There was some classic rock even. Already classic rock was a term by the mid 80s. So we were pushing original concept, original aspects of music. We try not to stick to one genre. We keep our ears open. Tom Payne's background, well, it was, we called it the Chameleon Club. We gave it its own name. We gave it its own entrance so you didn't have to walk through the restaurant to get to the back. We, we would enter off of Christian Street. And uh, in the three years that we were there, we did such a diversity of music, but it was an exciting time, I think, for the Lancaster music scene and for Lancaster music fans, because they developed a trust with me and what I was booking. And they would, I would just say, here's a new band, come check them out, and they would. Hey, unless it's been shoved down my throat on MTV or played 30 times a week on the local station, why would I want to go see this band? And, and I, I always miss that uh, as we got bigger. After three years at the old club, we were outgrowing it. I mean, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we were packed every night, and I was turning people away, and we had lines. And there was lim physical limitations, not only for the amount of people we could hold. We were butted up against apartment buildings, and if you had big, loud rock bands, it was noise issues, uh, especially for the crowd leaving at 2 in the morning and 
so I started to search. Am I going to stay here or am I going to move on? And uh, decided to, to move on. I knew I could cut open the floor. I like the idea of having a balcony because it compresses the crowd. You can still get that intimacy feeling. Um, whereas if you just have a big flat space, you can only get so many people close to the band and then the rest just hit to keep going further and further back. It was a pretty neat little space, uh, though it was divided into three separate floors. There was a little lounge in the basement. There was the main meeting room with a dance floor on the, on the main floor. And then they had the secret meeting room on the top floor. The chameleon itself was a canvas. Rich enlisted various community artists, various artists from the community, and gave them walls. It was basic lighting, and it was a floor, and a dance floor, and a stage. We had a construction crew come in and do the major work, but as far as the platforms, the stage, um, putting the bar in, that was all a labor of love. As far as decor, bands that have traveled, bands that have been in a lot of clubs, are blown away by this club. On the main floor, which is the main concert floor where the stage is and the dance floor is, we have, there's two ends to a very long bar, a 90 foot bar. One's called the Atlantis bar. And then there was the industrial bar, which is closest to the dance floor. When you approach that bar, it's bent in such a way that you see the sir, which I don't know how well it works, but it's a psychological thing of getting people to be polite when they ask for that beer. When you come in from a certain angle, all you see is the word vice. So it's a little tongue-in-cheek thing that whether or not people see it, I know it's there and I did it. There's a boat in the ceiling and oars and fish and people swimming. He plastered in um, shells and abalone, and shiny stuff. So that it shimmered like you were underwater and he painted in those tones. And again, there's statues that might have been Atlantis, the statues in Atlantis, broken pillars and statues with no arms and, and you know, and fern, fake fern, and you knew you were underwater. People contributed shells, volunteers came in. It was great. And you go up to the mezzanine level, which, the balcony or the mezzanine, and that bar was thematically designed as Millie Ways. The restaurant at the end of the universe, right? We have the Desperados, which is a cool little southwestern motif bar. And the picture on the wall in there is of me, by the way, and nobody knows that. Tiki Bar. Was sort of a roof deck with, that had a tropical flair. Lizard Lounge downstairs, which is sort of subterranean, where we play the blues. The Chameleon is my, is my champion because so much time was involved. I would develop new ideas for a section I already finished, so that kept it unfinished in my mind. So there's an emotional attachment to the club. It created an atmosphere for the bands to walk in and just be like, wow, this place is really amazing. We wish we had something like this where we grew up. If you were Alice going through, you know, the looking glass or something, going to this little door to come out onto the stage, you had to sort of stoop down and then you could stand it fully erect, yeah. Love the monitors, got the good foot props. Yeah, One of the best foot prop setups in America. Like 20, 25 minutes back in uh, 1999 or whatever, or whenever, I was on that stage. I, uh, I felt like the king of the world. It's all right here at the Chameleon. Who could want anything more? Ritz never booked the club like money was an issue. There were shows that Ritz did that he knew, I'm going to make a lot of money on this show. We're going to do really well on this show. We're going to make money. The band's going to make money. The club's going to make money on this show. And then there'd be other shows where Rich would be like, this is a really great band. This is a really great band, and even if nobody else likes them, 
I want him to play here. The flyers that they would put together, and that was Carl Heitmuller. Uh, in terms of graphics and how it relates to it, I, that's what I think about. You would find that just about anywhere at uh, the old um, BBC, Prince Street and surrounding areas. A lot of uh, different shops like uh, Zap and Company. And you would see them taped up to the window. Everybody that's come into that club says, this is, this is in Lancaster? Like, where did this come from? People say, you're going to Lancaster? What, you don't, you speak Amish? What's in Lancaster? But I mean, if you look at the town, it's really a pretty swinging place culturally. I mean, there's theater companies, there's symphonies, there's orchestras, there's museums, there's uh, outdoors things to do, and then there's the chameleon, which encompasses all of that. Yeah, the, the, the cultural scene is very uh, vibrant here. There's also the outlying, you know, rural areas. There, if you want to get away, you know, you know, get away from civilization for a while, that's that's entirely possible. Groups that you may not hear for two years, you come here and you say, "Who are these guys? These are great." And then two years down the road, you're watching MTV, and there's that same band you saw, and you're going, "My gosh, why did they come to Lancaster?" It's because the Chameleon Club's here. I mean, we were surprised that this club even existed in this place. You see the Amish people in their horse and buggies, and who, who's going to come to this show? <laughs> you know? but, uh, but then you, you get there and you realize that this was the destination for so many, you know, so many people from teenagers on up who needed some place to go and some sort of cultural center for, for hanging out and for listening to great music. I think Lancaster, before the Chameleon opened, was fairly typical of a lot of cities of size, or even a lot of bigger cities. And that, you know, most establishments that run bands kind of do it as an afterthought, uh, whereas here the music was always the focus. There was a good creative uh, current in uh, Lancaster, which is not there in all towns. There are places where people are nice, but you don't feel valued because you don't feel like they get you. In the early goings of the Chameleon promoting a show, everyone likes, I'm just going to go to Philly. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, well, it's, it's two bucks more, it's ten bucks to park, you got to pay a guy five bucks to watch your car, <laughs> you know, and all the shenanigans that go on in Philly, tolls, gas, whatever. And then you walk in and you're, you're a number. And I know that experience is exciting when you're younger. We've seen almost a, an inversion of that concept where, wait a minute, I, I like the intimacy. Rich was a real stickler for great sound and then subsequent ownership have really followed in that tradition. So a band can't say, I'm playing a cow town that doesn't know how to put on a show. And a fan can say, the quality's as good or better than, than Philadelphia or a surrounding market. And what's more, I feel a sense of intimacy that I'm deprived of in a major market just by virtue of the size of the city. I mean, recent years, Lancaster has admittedly become more metropolitan and more worldly, and it's a terrific turn of events. It has a lot to do with the chameleon, has a lot to do with the explosion of the arts in general. So people are traveling hundreds of miles. They're coming from Pittsburgh, they're coming from Scranton, they're coming from northern Jersey, and I think that's terrific. Every now and then I'm going up Water Street and see a line in the middle of winter that extends a block and a half down around the corner and out to Prince Street. Uh, I doubt if all those people are from the city of Lancaster. G. Love and Special Sauce came in and did freestyle for about 45 minutes and then G. Love endorsed my candidacy for, uh, for mayor. What's so great about your town? Come to a place that I know. I will show you some bands. Turn up the sweat, the tears, the blood, the volume, and give you one night that you'll be like, I will never misjudge a small town again. The very existence of the venue, having a place to play, helps fuel the scene. I mean, if you live in a town that just doesn't offer a place to play, especially for original music, you're just not gonna get original bands developing. There's no, it's like beating your head against the wall. We're now at the home of Suddenly Tammy in Columbia, Pennsylvania. It's a church, a beautiful church. And with me, Ken Heitmuller and Jay Sorrentino and Beth. Beth is with us by the power of photograph. 
You know, the rest of the country continues to say, oh, there's a buzz in Lancaster, and of course, we have an instance mission, and live is happening. The music scene in Lancaster has actually been fairly active for some time. It's just now with the great success of live that people are paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, the Ocean Blue obviously was the first band to come out of here. Uh, the Oogies won a national competition. Um, Stand Up was a national band until uh, sadly uh, two members of that band were killed in a car crash. Um, Wax Mountain, Cherry Twister, Brown Bones. And while the whole band is not uh, from here, the bass player from Pavement is from Lancaster. Mike Pitts, I play bass for the Innocence Mission. Rich, uh, he, he was extremely helpful. He had us in fairly regular rotation there, and uh, he was very encouraging. I remember him actually taking us aside once and, and saying, I, I don't know exactly what it is you're doing, and I'm not even sure that I like it, but it's but you, you definitely have something there, and people are responding to it. So uh, it basically, he was saying he wanted to continue booking us. There, there, there was something about what we were doing, even if it maybe wasn't his you know, cup of tea. The, the chameleon has always had, uh, it, it was very instrumental in, in us uh, developing as a band because they, it gave us a chance. We played there consistently, so it gave us a chance to work on new songs, having an audience to play them for. Uh, it, got us, it, it got us tight as a band because we played there a lot. We had huge, I mean, live was a phenomenon. Live was a phenomenon worldwide. They sort of grew in, out of the community. They grew up at the club. They made just amazing music there. Even when they weren't performing, they'd you know use the place once in a while to practice and uh, you know work out the kinks. If you watch much MTV, chances are you already know that a band called Live is making it big. Just the fact that they play our video next to Michael Jackson's five million dollar video is pretty. It's pretty incredible, you know. What's pretty incredible is that just a few years ago they were just out of high school, still dreaming of making it big. Back then, they were known as public affection and played a lot at clubs like the Chameleon in Lancaster. Tonight, they were back with lights, cameras, and a slew of production people for another MTV shoot. This band is watching its album climb the charts steadily already at 94 on Billboard, and they're expecting even bigger success after their MTV tour this spring. Jennifer Gilbert, News 8. This was like one of those return shows where local boys make it big, come back, and do just one last event. I remember that moment. It was on the back end of Throwing Copper, we had decided that we needed to go back home and play home. I love these guys, I love their music, and like I say, I'm like a proud father. These are live tickets. Rich Ruoff is proud his boys are coming home. The band Live is performing at his club, and he holds the keys to seeing them. It should be interesting when we get up to the next block. Only about 500 lucky fans will get an up close listen with the band that originated in York. By any live rock and roll concert standard. This is a great show. Fans know. That's why they mobbed one of three places that sold concert tickets. Two, ma'am. Two. Some paid more than the regular price. It's going to be good to see them Friday at Hershey, but you just get a better feeling for the group when you're inside a small arena like this. FM 97 WLAN. Hey, I'm Wendy Hamill, and if you're looking for live tickets, there aren't any left. I'm sorry, but keep listening. The band's popularity and reputation have captured national music attention, and a half-hour show is in the works. They're huge now. They're you know slowly becoming one of the biggest bands in the world. And so the boys of York changed their own colors and their name, and have returned to the home crowd and plenty of public affection. Yeah, at that point, the crowd that we had grown up in front of was there, 
It was our first public recognition of our own success. When we played that Chameleon show, interesting enough, where Rich introduced us, you know, we had never really had anybody ever introduce the band. And we just decided it would only be appropriate if Rich got up and said a few words. I introduced him, I came out on stage, and I'm like, let's give it up for live! And they just all screamed at once, and it was this huge energy that rushed off the crowd. And I've never played music, but now I understand why people like being rock stars, because it's a cool feeling. Even the band took a step back, like, whoa, you know, that was very intense, because it was honest, it was heartfelt. It was like, local guys have done good, good for you, you know, great cheer. And so that was a, that was a great moment. You know, there was definitely a magical feeling in the air, and he got everybody hyped up. But the interesting thing about it was the moment of walking on stage, it was the first time that even me as a person that I actually went, wow, you know, like, I'm in the same club with the same amount of people, but the energy is something totally new. There was something that we created in this little small hole in the wall in Lancaster that the world embraced. And it was special for that audience and it was special for us as a band because we couldn't share that experience with anyone else. Gorgeous, beautiful woman, great voice. The Daves, those kind of bands really made the Chameleon Club a place to go to and really set it apart from all the other nightclubs and it just grew from there. In heaven there is no beer, no beer, that's why we drink it here. And when we're all gone from here, our friends will be drinking all the beer. In heaven there is no wine, no wine, so we drink Brave Combo, one of the best polka rock and roll bands you're ever going to hear. We're at the Chameleon Club. <laughs> yeah, this is a great place. And we think too, and we hope, that there are, that some of the audience here does have a connection with the real polka scene. And they, in fact, we get letters from people from this area who know who the Stankies are, who know about the cadets and the coal miners. I think one of the things that Brave Combo loved about the Chameleon Club was the fact that we literally are a German Pennsylvania Dutch town that we had our own set of clubs on the outskirts of Lancaster that were specifically set up for polka. I was actually asked one time, I think it was in the Austin Chronicle, they asked me to name the top 10 venues in the country and uh, the Chameleon was on that list. And without a doubt, my memories of it, if, if all clubs could be that way, touring in a band wouldn't be even difficult. At one time during one of their live shows, our uh, at the time, Soundman, later on to be partial owner of the club, uh, Adam, uh, piped their live set down into the recording studio and got the entire, um, got the entire set live. Uh, later on, remixed and sent it to the band uh, as a courtesy, just, you know, did this, thought you might like it. They loved it so much, they included it on one of their albums, and that album went on to win a Grammy. So, technically, Wizard Records has recorded a Grammy-winning song. I think the frog became Mighty Head. Saturday I took her out. We laughed and laughed about all the things we did. Rich spent a lot of money on Mighty Head. I mean, I think Rich put in that recording studio downstairs thinking Mighty Head was gonna go. We say goodbye each night whenever it gets dark. I count the minutes we're apart. And time can go so slow. The chameleon name is very far reaching, and we're finding out. And as far as this, uh, as an indie label, you know, it could be dangerous to start a ground up type thing. But I, we're real excited because this, this club it has produced so many great bands, and I think that people are really responding to that well. So I, I think we're all really looking forward to doing the indie label route. I, I mean, we'd love to, we've always wanted to do that. That was, yeah. you know, either that or sell eight million albums right away. <laughs> that would be good too. <laughs> Guess I'm blinded to all the good things in this world to see. It is
standing out the water's edge My whole life I've been afraid to jump in Queen Bee was originally, I think, from the uh, Penn State area, and they uh, they played everywhere. I mean, these guys were just absolutely amazing. Probably one of the most heartbreaking and devastating moments was losing a really good, probably one of the best blues singers we've ever had at the Chameleon Club. Queen Bee, if you've ever seen the band play, was just an amazing act. The musicians in the band were top-notch, but the lead singer, she was just absolutely the sweetest, most beautiful, God-gifted voice you've ever heard. We're gonna miss her. And even the cover bands was only a handful, and they had already played the other, the other big club in town, the Village, which was predominantly what you call a top 40 club. And they've always been that way, and they're very good at it. The scene, it's not like a Seattle scene, it's very diverse. We have everything from uh, new wave to uh, reggae, to blues, to jazz, to just any kind of music you can imagine around here. In a way, it means if you want to hear any music, you gotta go out to the clubs and hear it. And, you know, it'll be through here. I mean, just about anyone who's on the charts now played here one time or another. I mean, so there are legendary stories about the ones that got away, like how Nirvana was sent in a tape and they decided they weren't interested in it right before Teen Spirit, you know, what just went right through the roof. I mean, that's kind of a joke, but he's, he's hit far more than he's missed. We've had just about everyone in here at one time or another. Everyone who's on the charts played this club. Look at the playlist of who's coming in here on a given week. It's hard to believe the same guy picked all these bands. You know, you'll have four guys from the high school one week and and, and, uh, and Joan Osborne the next day, and then and Richard Thompson, and then you'll have some hardcore band throwing, you know, throwing their bodies around on stage. You, you'd think the owner was schizophrenic. Maybe he is, I haven't checked. And we have fun doing a diversity of artists. Uh, it, it makes it more interesting for me. It keeps the positive energy flowing in the club. It's not, you know, we're not stuck in the same format night after night. When Marilyn Manson played the Chameleon Club, um, it was early in his career. So the days leading up to the show, the chameleon got calls from people saying, we hear he kills animals, and if he kills animals, we will blow up your club. And I'm thinking, you will save the chickens and kill us. The day of the show, Adam Clark says, hey, some cop was just here, and he left this. And there was like a five or six page typewritten thing and it just says all this stuff, lewd and crude, and if he does any of it, basically, we're arresting him, Marilyn Manson, you, Mr. Miller, Mr. Ruoff, we're arresting everybody. And so I came in the back door, and I went in the band room, and I walked up to this guy, and I said, are you Marilyn? And he says, no, I'm Twiggy, that's Marilyn. And I walked up to this guy named Marilyn, and I said, hey, Marilyn, the cops were just here, and they said, if you do any of the stuff on this list, we're all going to jail. All of us, we're going to jail. And he looks at me, and I tore the damn thing up, I threw it in the trash, and I said, now do your show. And he rocked the house. The first time I played the chameleon, it was one of my first 
shows outside of New York City. We drove out here and of course we were like, wow, what a beautiful area, it's so gorgeous. You know, we live in these disgusting little apartments in New York with 10 roommates and, and it just felt so good to get out in this beautiful natural environment. Rich Ruoff was talking to me and, and I was telling him, oh, it's so great to be out of the city, it's wonderful. And he said, oh, you know, well, I've got a canoe. You want me to take you canoeing? And, uh, and I was like, sure, that sounds great. But, you know, Rich took us out canoeing the next day. Little did I know at the time, but this is not something that you normally get with a club owner. Rich starts in a little club and then makes a bigger club and then says, hmm, how can I make this club bigger? I'm gonna get a TV show. <laughs> oh yeah, I gotta get a TV show. And so he goes out and he gets a TV show. I became the Bayou Swarm Band and uh, said they had this network that was on TV and uh, the Chameleon Club was one of their favorites and then Chubby Carey and the Bayou Swarm Band become one of the Chameleon's favorites and they said, hey, let's put it together. Next time I come to town, let's make it happen. Uh, we did that segment and as a matter of fact, I seen some the other night, man, just looking at it and God, that just brings memories, man. Say what? He was out of his Ooh, mind. Man. He was. Always the and around man. You can stay but that noise got to go. You can stay but that noise got to go. You can run that bitch up on your TV screen. Politically, the things the chameleon was doing weren't really mainstream. Anybody could be there and go there and do what they wanted to do. They wanted to stop it. He did these Sunday shows so kids could come and join the chameleon and put on shows and have something for the kids to do. But we're not selling any liquor. And these kids sure aren't buying any soda because it's a dollar a bottle. They're asking us for water. We're not even charging them for water. And we're giving them a place to go. And it's no but the rules. Well, what are kids supposed to do? The raid that happened here was um, Friday night in July, maybe July 20th, if I'm correct. It was a raid organized by the city. You know, there was 150 people in the club. It was a dance night. When the police entered, they asked me to shut down the music, and, um, and I did. And then I was told to raise the music back up uh, by my manager, and that was after he talked to another police officer at the time, because the raid was pretty much over. Uh, nobody was arrested except for the one patron who was acting up. And uh, so I put the music back on because the crowd, you know, they were getting antsy. I didn't know it at the time, but I had my headphones on, and I'm focusing on the crowd, and. I can't really hear this officer yelling at me to shut the music off, and then finally I did, and he had already yelled it, I guess, several times. They pulled him out of the booth and knocked him unconscious and cuffed him and, struck, and choked him again when he came conscious. All I'm trying to do is calm things down, and I can't get any of the police officers to tell me who's in charge. When I woke up, I was on the street, and I didn't really know what happened. I'm not a violent guy. I'm a very nice guy. Um, you know, uh, I think he got a little upset at the fact that his DJ was on the ground 
that was how we both got arrested basically for me not shutting down the music and him being upset about his club being raided and all the political mess that was going on you know with his dad running for mayor and the other mayor claiming he had nothing to do with it Lancaster City Council President Nelson Polite is upset about recent actions of Lancaster Police in connection with the July 20th inspection at the Chameleon Club. The public record in question is an audio tape. On it are the recorded statements from this special council session. It's common practice to record such meetings, and on this tape, more than a dozen people shared their accounts of police activities at the Chameleon during that liquor control inspection. Some people were saying that it was politically motivated because Rich's dad was running for mayor and that uh, the present mayor had uh, sent, the, sent the cops in just because of that. And I don't think there were any violations anyway. I have a tendency not to buy into those conspiracy theories because I don't think anybody in politics is that smart. If I wasn't going to have the decision to stay in that business, there would have been a, a massive federal lawsuit uh, because you need to keep people in their place and you can't operate a business if you're gonna be harassed like that. I would've won, I mean, no doubt. I think with Rich, what, you, what I've noticed is he loved music so much. He was such an advocate for live music. He took this great risk and it had great reward. He refused to become a jaded curmudgeon of a club owner like I've seen at hundreds of venues all over the world. The moment he thought that was possible, he got out. He just wanted to continue to love music. I think what happens with any business is it ran its course, and Rich wanted to pursue, you know, other things such as raising a family, getting married, having kids, and it's really tough to do that when you're practically living out of the club, well, literally living out of the club. Um, also, the industry changed. So I was ready out of the business. This raid happened. Very negative experience. I sold it to a partnership of people, included my old sound man, Adam Clark. They always had a love for Lancaster and the club especially. They became friends with a guy named Jim Albright, so they formed a partnership and they, uh, they bought the business from me. Well, they ran it for over a year and then they decided they wanted to move on, so they sold it directly to Nick and Holly Skiatis. Nick Skiatis ran a smaller location called the Historic Blue Star. It was a cool little bar and they also did live music there, so he had experience in that, in that venue. I find it impressive how much effort money and energy they pumped into Chameleon. They've shared my vision and they keep it rolling and it's good to see. This is a home, this is a place where you're comfortable as a fan, as a band, even as a staff member and as a promoter. And, and it's just lended itself to this terrifically prolific music community. It's one of those sort of places that means something to the people in the town and you can feel that from teenagers on up who needed some place to go and some sort of cultural center for, for hanging out and for listening to great music. One of the seminal people of uh, playing in this town back in the day was a uh, good friend, Jeremy Weiss. He did a lot for the local bands and the local scene. Rich is a mentor. He always had the same approach. A welcoming smile, bands were made to feel comfortable, they had a positive experience, marketed the heck out of it, so they had one of the best shows. I learned so much from that. And I think the subsequent ownership adopted many of the same modalities. You really can divide club people into two basic categories. There's the people who do it because it's a business, but then there's the people who do it because they feel like it's a calling and because either they love music themselves and are huge fans or they are musicians themselves or were and they really feel like they want to make the experience special for the artist as well. Running a club is the most challenging, rewarding type of ownership you could possibly have. We do every kind of music here possible. Blues, funk, it's a rap, metalcore.
Jeremy initially signed us to his record label, CI. So, uh, you know, he gave us our start, got our first, you know, press release out there. So here comes August Burns Red down the pike, and I said, boy, they, they've really got something. Knowing them through the years has been one of the most pleasant periods in my life. I mean, they are terrific guys. They deserve everything they get. They're uh, fierce advocates for Lancaster. We know we can do a show with Jeremy and go and play at a packed house at the Community Club every time we come home. They never let anybody forget when they're filming their globally distributed to be released, highly anticipated live DVD and live CD, they come back to Lancaster County. When they want to play a Christmas show that that pulls in all the folks over the years for almost a more party reunion atmosphere, Chameleon Club. They grew up playing shows here and uh, took it to a completely different level. We can, because of the Chameleon and their attitudes towards local businesses and, and bands make Lancaster a hometown for them, a second hometown. We really like this place. The layout of it's really cool with the balcony and everything. There's not many clubs around that, that have such a high capacity, but still you can pretty much see the band from everywhere. No town rocks like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> We are starting to get bands that, that seek us out, that do want to play our club, that want to strategically pick locations to, to do hype shows. You don't find many venues like the Chameleon Club. You come in here and you just feel the energy from crowds. People feel comfortable there. There's a terrific balance of security and safety, coupled with the freedom to interact with the bands. The logistically, the way the room is laid out, the bands are almost compelled to visit with their fan base. As a musician, it's nice having this venue around to, in a way, you know, it keeps that music scene going, it propagates it. It just has this magnetism about it that it's very unique for the city it's in. It almost doesn't belong here for the, the perceivable demographic that we have, but we've created that demographic over 20 years and it's stronger than ever. That was another thing about the chameleon, you know, that was part of it. Be who you are. Be who you are. And that philosophy stood us well. Fans love this place. Absolutely love this. Not, not only from the aspect of the vibe of the place, of how the employees treat them. We're all family here, so, and then that flows over. Playing there and going to see bands there, that was my, uh, my, my cultural center. People that I still consider friends now are people that I met and uh, built relationships with as being there. So that, that's, that's really important. I was so thankful for what Chameleon had done for me. Obviously things change, so completely unpredictable. I like to see the Chameleon exactly where it is. Doing live music, pleasing people, mom-pop ownership. You really do build up a, a strong relationship with the people that are coming in and supporting you every week, and, and it's almost like a family-type atmosphere in there. After a while you come into the fold and you legitimately care about everyone that comes in there and want the best for them. I made a lot of friends through coming to shows at the Chameleon Club, um, some of my best friends. Chameleon's always going to be there, like, people will sell it, it's just been sold a couple of times, but it's always the Chameleon. When you drive down Water Street you're still going to see that battered banner that says Chameleon on it and that awning is still going to be there. No matter how busy it is, no matter how often the uh, nightlife scene changes, it's just really reassuring to know that the chameleon is here 
come to the chameleon, make some friends, pick up an instrument, promote a show. You can't fill the void that this place would create if it wasn't here. of the chameleon I'm not sure what that holds it's constantly changing but right now I've got three bands waiting out back to load in and 600 kids ready to line up out front so I need to go <laughs> <laughs>